I pray you've been following along in the Life Group series, Powerful Words. We've been talking about together, why share the gospel, when and where do we share the gospel. This last week, learning how to tell your story, that every one of us has a story. And this week, really talking about what do we share, how do we share the gospel, how do we build a bridge to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And your Life Group material you work through during the week, you'll be talking about those specific things and ways and areas and places that you can share his story. Because his story is part of our story. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to Ephesians chapter number 4? Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2 rather, uh, beginning in verse number 1 as we continue this series together of the reason that we share. We talked about several important things, six truths we're going to talk about over these uh, coming Sundays together. We'll add a last one in the last Uh, Sunday of this month, but why we share and understanding a little bit more about the gospel. Again, the application part, how do we share, why do we share, where do we share, when do we share, is all found in this Life Group material. I encourage you, if you've missed some, you can go online, lifeway.com, you can watch individual sessions. They're like $2 or something, you can watch them. They're powerful, they're relevant, they're applicable, uh, they're interesting, they will help you think through this idea that we have this exciting, incredible opportunity to impact a lost and dying world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you on the front side before we dive into our message this morning, I will promise you I could name several pastors that you would never hear this sermon, right? Uh, You will never hear this scripture preached in this way, probably on TV in some ways. Um, and, And the reason why is some would call this a Debbie Downer, right? We're going to talk about some really bad news, all right? We'll talk about some bad news, and that's going to get you really excited and thinking, well, praise God, I came to church today. I want to hear some bad news, preacher. That's why everybody comes to church is to hear bad news, right? But I want to remind you of a statement I've said many times before, and you've heard it before. Until we understand, or for some of us that already know this, until we're reminded of how bad the bad news is, we won't really appreciate nor understand how good the good news is. And by the way, on the top side, the good news is really good news. It is great news. It is the gospel. And we're going to talk about these truths. Before we understand the gospel, we have to be reminded of some truths. But remember, just back the last two we've talked about, we have, we have one great creator, right? God is the source of all creation. God is the creator of all creation. He's the sustainer of all creation, and he cares about all of creation. We talked about that a few weeks ago. The last one we talked about, that we have one great purpose, right? That humanity was created to reflect God. Humanity was created to worship God, to enjoy God. And most importantly, all of that created to have a relationship with God. Those are the backdrops. That's the background of this 3151 challenge. This is the background of why we're talking about the call to tell someone. Someone in your sphere of influence, somebody in your class, somebody in your workplace, somebody in your, next to your cubicle, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody in your family that does not know Jesus Christ. We are called, encouraged, challenged, motivated, commanded to tell others about what Jesus has done for us. And by the way, hasn't Jesus done a lot for you? Good. 19 people of you. Praise God. Let me just ask that one more time to give you an opportunity that you could respond all about us. I'm really quiet. We'll just say it quietly, but let's just say together, those of us who know Christ, and if you don't, God's done good things for you too. So you can just go ahead and amen with the rest of us. Hasn't God been good to you? Amen? There is no question God has been good to you. He is the unstoppable God. And we declared this morning that our God saves. That's good news in the midst of a declining culture, in the midst of we wonder and we worry and we think about things. We think, how can we do what we're doing? How can we make an impact? How can we go on? We know. We read the Word of God and we're reminded. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Let me invite you, if you don't mind, and in standing on of reading God's Word. Um, don't do this every Sunday, and I should. I feel bad because I feel like we play Baptist aerobics and you're tired. And, um, but God's Word is so holy. Let's read it together. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the Spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, too, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Feel good about yourselves? This is a great self-esteem pep talk this morning. You are children of wrath. You're of the devil, right? 
and you fulfilled the lust of your flesh. Feel good? Now, if you ever would circle something in your Bible, and some of you, I know you don't circle, but if you ever circle something in your Bible, here's one of those moments to circle. All of that is the backdrop. Verse number four. But God. (laughs) But God being rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, our sins, he made us alive together with Christ, By grace, you have been saved. Father, would you speak these words of truth into our life? God, would you remind us of where we came with those this morning that don't know you as Christ, as Savior, nor would they recognize about where they are and the offer of salvation you would give this morning. And I pray with everything that is in my body, in my being this morning, there will be some person that needs to hear and come face to face the reality of where they are and where they could be. May they have this morning. We're praying for but God moments this morning. They would hear the call of the Savior that our God saves. God, for the rest of us, may we be reminded of where we once were. Father, what we formerly were. And may we never walk there again and realize we are saved by grace. Lord, help this preacher to communicate these words, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you take your outline there, we're going to dive in very quickly to see these truths and paint the picture on the front side that makes us go, wow. It kind of one of those, oh, kind of a moment. So let's look and see together. We have a great creator, one great creator. We have one great purpose. And thirdly, we have one great problem. And it is a big one. It is a huge dilemma. What do we do about it? Now, a lot of our world doesn't see it as a dilemma, but God's word is crystal clear, and we've come to discover and understand that it is a dilemma, and the one word we find is the word sin. Now, when we hear the word sin, and I can't help it, it comes to my mind that I can't help but think about years gone by, and this is kind of how our world thinks about sin, as I think about the church lady on Saturday Night Live telling the word sin. Now, see, you may remember her. She would, you know, the church lady, and she would say sin. Right, And she made it sound so funny and so enjoyable, and it is fun. It's good to poke fun of ourselves. But sometimes when you step back from that, you realize that sometimes that's how our world views sin. As if it's something funny, it's not that big of a deal. It's something that we make too much of a deal about. And we don't, but yet I want to challenge you this morning, how often do we talk about sin? We don't want to talk about it very often because it's uncomfortable. It really comes close to home if we're really honest about it, right? And it really kind of is a little depressing to us. We have to talk about something that makes us feel really good about ourselves. And, but I want to talk about this truth to help us get this idea. And I, and, I, and I use these words that will describe about where we were or are. But for some of us, this describes where we were. But for some of you this morning, and I love you with all of my heart, and, but I want you to hear these truths, not from me. These are not my opinions or my thoughts because they're wasted. But these are God's words out of love for you to understand where you were or where you are right now. Because there are some of you sitting in this room that I'm praying the Holy Spirit of God will help you see this is where you are. But this is not where you have to stay. Let's see together the first one. We have a huge limit sin. Romans 3, 10 through 11 says this. As scripture says, not one person has God's approval. No one understands. No one searches for God. No one. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, where you were born, who you were born to. It does not matter. No one understands God. No one searches God because of sin. Notice these things about sin. Number one, we are or we were dead. We don't just have a behavior problem or a moral problem. We have a life problem. We are dead to the things of God. God's word is so incredibly clear about this. Romans 5 verse 12 reminds us, Therefore, just as one through one man sin entered the world, Adam we're talking about, and a death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Right? Romans 6.23, the first part of that says, For the wage of sin is death. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of of God. Colossians 2.13 says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. Listen, our problem is not that we're bad people. Our problem is not that we just had a, a, a moral issue. Our problem is we are spiritually dead without Christ. And let me illustrate this point, how I know that's the case and how that you were born that way. 
I have never once sat down with any of my three children when they were younger and said, now listen, today we're going to have a class on how to be bad. Okay? I want to teach you how to lie. I want to teach you how to be disrespectful. I want to teach you how to, to cry and throw a fit when you don't get your way at that blessed Walmart line. And if I ever meet, if I ever meet who created the candy aisle at the cash register, I might have to hurt them in the name of Jesus. I mean, really? I mean, they are sinful people who created that. Are they not? They never had kids. They couldn't have had kids unless they just want to have retribution against all those who had them and they want to experience what they experienced. I don't know, but you never have to teach your kid. Now, we get up here to the Walmart aisle, be sure now, I want you to scream as loud as you can, embarrass me as much as you can, and make me want to beat you with an image of your life. I've never once, you know, you had to tell your kids that? I mean, no. Why? Because they're born that way. They're born with a sin nature which is bent towards doing, watch this, wrong. Oh, not my little angel, not mine. Oh, <laughs> just wait. It'll happen. Boy or girl, it doesn't matter. It may come later for some, but one day it'll come. And you'll be shocked and flabbergasted. I can't believe my child lied to me. And I would say to you, believe it. Because it's part of who they are. They're dead spiritually. Committing sin doesn't make us a sinner. We commit sin because we're already a sinner. Right? That's an important truth. Paul says here, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. These two words describe the exact same thing. Every man, woman, boy, and girl has a sin problem and thus a dead problem, a death problem. Now, no doubt you say, well, some people seem to be more wicked than me and some people seem to be more holier than others. But all of us, no matter where we fall in the spectrum, all of us, if we're honest, are equal failures in achieving God's holiness and perfect standard of righteousness. We can't live up to it. We cannot attain it. It's not possible. And because we can't, we cannot have a right relationship with the Holy God. We are separated from Him by our sin. So great news, great news. You are dead. Don't you feel encouraged in point number one? Now, maybe you were dead. It's a little more encouraging when you think of it from that perspective, but we are or were dead. Notice the second thing, we are or were depraved. We're depraved. We are damaged goods. We are in a season or we are part of decay. Our world is decaying. Why? Because of sin. Our bodies decay. Why? Because of sin. Both on the outside it has an effect and also, more importantly, on the inside. Galatians 5, 16 reminds us of this truth. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature. What wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Next says, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you're not on, under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition. Uh, sorry, I skipped ahead. Uh, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger. He names all of these sins all the way through, right? Verse 21. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have a decay, depraved problem. Most of the time, we don't have to do a lot of convincing. Satan doesn't do a lot of convincing to us to sin. Our flesh takes care of a lot of it. We give Satan a lot of credit we ought not give him. Because our flesh, we give into our flesh so often. Even as believers, we go back to our old way of living, our old way of life. Our flesh is so easily entangles us. It draws us back in to do what our minds and our flesh want us to do. Why? Romans 8, 7, verse 8 reminds us. Because the mindset of the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh, watch this, cannot please God. Wow. So if you don't know Christ and you never understood where you are as a sinner, it is not possible for you to please God. You were dead and you are or were depraved. Thirdly, notice this. Even more encouraging, you are defeated. 
You are or were defeated. Again, feeling courage, feeling good. Glad I came to church today on a nice cloudy October morning. Praise the Lord. I'm dead, I am depraved, and I am defeated. No, it's going to get worse, so just hang on. Right? Ephesians 4 reminds us of this truth. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles, for they are, watch this, hopelessly confused. Do you remember finding yourself at that point in your life, hopelessly confused? Or maybe you're there now. Verse 18, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life of God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. When we're at this stage in our lives or we go back to them, we are just like that hamster on that wheel in that cage, right? We are going 90 miles an hour. You ever watch those hamsters? Man, they can make that wheel spin really fast. They're exhausted by the time they get off that wheel. But what happens? They've gone nowhere. That's what sin does to us. We think we're going somewhere. We think we're doing something. We're spinning it really hard and really, really fast. But we're really getting nowhere. It is futile. The world tries to tell us you're doing fine. But the reality is this. You are living a defeated life without Jesus Christ. Notice this next one. We are or were the devil's. Now, your mama or daddy may have told you sometime that you were from the devil or of the devil. I know mine did on more than one occasion. Probably had a teacher of two who thought I was of the devil, right? Uh, even in church, I probably had a few of those teachers who thought I was of the devil, right? But here's the, good, here's the bad news. You are or you were of the devil. The Bible is abundantly clear. If you are not for God, you are against God. How do you know? Scripture tells us. Romans 6, verse 16. Don't you realize... That you become slave of whatever you choose to obey. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. James 4.4, 4, you adulteress. James doesn't mince any words. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so when I'm living in sin, I find myself as an enemy of God. Jesus says it in John chapter 8, verse 44 to the Pharisees. The one who practices sin is of the devil. Or sorry, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. He echoes this in 1 John 3, 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And lastly, and the most encouraging one of all, here's the good one. You are doomed. Ah, don't you feel so good? You are doomed. You're living a life of despair. Now here's the problem about these truths. Satan does his best to hide these truths from mankind. Soften them, make them not seem so bad, make them not seem so harsh. Folks, I want them to be harsh. I want them to be the truth, reality, because when Jesus spoke about sin, he meant no words. He made certain we knew and understood the consequences and the reality of sin and what it does. We don't have to look far in our world to see the absolute decay of our world as we know it and the, the sin that is destroying our world. Our country, our nation. Many times we think we live so safe and we never hear things. When I was sitting in a meeting Thursday morning at the Center for Families and Children, all of a sudden I hear Shrieking of tires and, and engines roaring and police cars everywhere. Now, I have to be honest, it was very hard for me to sit still in that meeting. I wanted to get up so bad and run out the front door of that place to see what was happening in case they needed my assistance. Sammy, you'd pray, you need my assistance really bad. I, I know, but, but I, I'm loved. I mean, I watched cops for an hour and a half last night before I went to bed. I mean, I, lo I love it. I wanted to go see it, right? We think in little old Petal, Mississippi, we're good. We don't have that many problems. Sin is going to have an effect in our society here in Petal, Mississippi. We know it does, though, don't we? 
there are people who are driving by this building and they don't even realize it yet, or maybe they do, that they are doomed and they are defeated. They live in despair and the end result of their life is hell. It's hell. There's no pretty way to paint it. This is not a scare the hell out of you message, but let it be very clear. Hell is the end result. And hell is an awful place. The problem is, many of them are in a living hell as they drive by these churches and even walk by me and you. And they're wondering, is anybody going to offer me something different? Ephesians 5 verse 6 says, Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the terrible wrath of God is upon all who do them. What a list. I'm dead. I'm defeated. I'm doomed. I'm the devils. I'm depraved. But we see, we have to understand the sin problem. Now, notice what mankind has done since the very beginning up until now. Some more D words. What have we done about sin? What do we try to figure out about this sin dilemma? Several things. Number one, we deny and distort God's view of sin. We deny that sin is even sin or we distort what God says is sin. That's why we live in a day and an age where people can take the word of God and say, well, that's what it says, but that's not really what it means. That's not really what God intended. That's how it happens. We deny or we distort God's view. Folks, if we start having to explain God out of this word of God, we're in deep weeds. We've gone out into the wrong spot. God doesn't need explaining. You can't explain him anyway at the end of the day because he's God and I'm not. But when you start trying to justify and rationalize the word of God as our society is doing, especially those who claim the name of Christ about certain things in their life and try to justify it or rationalize it, folks, that is dangerous ground to tread on. We must not deny or distort God's view of sin. Well, God is a loving God. God wouldn't have meant that. God wouldn't have said that. Hey, God is a loving God. That's exactly what he said. God is a loving God. What, is it, what do you mean by that? He's a loving God to tell us the truth because he knows in the end this only leads to destruction. He's trying to spare us from that kind of misery. The second thing we try to do, we try to delete our sin. We try to do what people do when they get caught with their computers doing things they shouldn't be doing. And they try to delete everything. But if you go to any forensic specialist, they can, you can pay a whole lot of money. Right? We've all had this horror, right? That, 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 that moment you hit the wrong button on your phone. Right? I deleted all my pictures. Well, you used to be you deleted your pictures. You couldn't delete them. They were all in your wallet. I mean, the worst thing that happens is you have a fire or a, or a flood and you lose your pictures. Now, it's one crack of a button and your whole child's life is gone. Right? And there are people who make lots of money. We think they're gone. But you know what? Many times, they're not gone. You can recover them. That's why, we, that's why we treat sin. Well, I'll just delete it. I'll just make it go away. But you can't. It's not possible. Thirdly, we try to defend it, to rationalize. Well, that's not really sin. That's not what I call sin. It's just living my own way. I can do what I want. It's my life. It's my choices. It doesn't affect anybody else. Well, if I've heard that a million times, but folks, if I could parade in front of you the numbers of people that cause and sin and cause such harm in their family, and they thought, I'm living for me, it doesn't affect anybody else, and the, the ravaging of families from a guy or a girl saying, it doesn't affect anybody. Hey, folks, be reminded, you may do your sin in secret, but I'll promise you, one day it will affect not only you, but those around you. It has a, it has a horrible effect. We can try to defend it or... This is my favorite one. We defer it. We defer it. We, we try to postpone it or the effects of it, right? Well, I got to live while I can. When I get older, have kids, get a job, do this, do that, whatever. I'll make things right. When I, I want to deal with my sin later, but right now, I don't have the time to do that. I don't want to worry about any of that. Don't bother me with that. I'll just defer to deal with sin later. But here's the problem. We can defer it, but we don't know when our life on this earth is going to be over. And you may defer Till it's too late. People say, well, well, you'll have a last chance. No, you won't. We see the decay of our society when a 14-year-old boy walks into his house in South Carolina and shoots his father, drives a truck to an elementary school and shoots kids, killing that 6-year-old boy. 
Then we're reminded, aren't we, our world is in serious decay. That family had no clue that they would wake up that day and their six-year-old child would not come back home from elementary school. I know every teacher and principal administrator, you see that and you cringe. We think, oh, not in Petal. I mean, this is a little old town, elementary school, about 600 kids. Going out for recess for crying out loud. Folks, we can deflect it all we want to, but the reality is it's still there. Notice these others. We try to disguise it or are deceptive about our sin. We try to decorate it, make it look pretty. It's like somebody telling me, hey, you got pig. I can dress up a pig, give the pig a bath. Even some bring the pigs inside the house, right? You know what it is at the end of the day? It's a pig. And if you give it some slop and some mud, they're going to jump in it as a happy little pig. Right? We can call it what we want to call it. We can say what we want to say about it. We can disguise it. Or we can do like Adam and Eve did. We try to be deceptive. We try to hide from it. We try to hide from sin. Or hide our sin. Right? What God has to go, quote, unquote, find Adam and Eve. Now, he knew where they were. They thought they could hide from God. I'll just hide of sin, of, of run away from God. The last two, we try to deflect our sin. We're good at this one now. Well, I'm not as bad as the mass murderer over here. I'm not that bad. So if my sin's not that bad, I must not be that bad a sinner. So you ask people from time to time, do you think you have a sin problem? Well, no, I'm not really. I'm not that bad as that problem. Here's the question. I'm not asking you comparing yourself to somebody else. Who are you? Who are you? We can't deflect our sin. Well, I'm a religious, I'm a religious person. I'm a nice guy. We go like the guy, the rich young ruler came and says, Lord, I've kept all the Ten Commandments. He says, well, take all that you have and sell it and give away the poor. And all of a sudden he walks away from that. Why? Because he was doing nothing more than deflecting my sin. I'm better than all these other people. Folks, it's not about being better. It's admitting that you're dead. It's admitting that you're doomed. It's admitting that you are of the devil. And I was there once. And so are the rest of us who know Christ. So it's not pointing a finger at somebody and saying, well, golly, you're a sinner. Hey, I was a sinner too. And I'm still a saint who is still capable of sinning and breaking the heart of God. And I do from time to time. I wish I didn't, but I do. The last thing we can do about our sin is we can delight in our sin. Well, we see this in our world, don't we? People have just uh, given God the bird and said, I'm going to do what I want to do, how I want to do it, and when I want to do it. And by the way, that's nothing new. That's from the very beginning of time. Go back and look at Adam and Eve and their two children, Cain and Abel. Cain didn't do the sacrifice the way God had asked. And God, Cain flips the proverbial bird at God and says, God, I will do what I want to do, how I want to do it, and when I want to do it. And you won't tell me what to do. That's what our world is doing today. We're delighting in sin. We love my sin. I'd rather be there than have to be accountable to God. And they look at Christians and they think to ourselves, well, why change anyway? I mean, they're doing the same sin I'm doing, so what difference does it make? So what's what's our response to all this this morning? Now that I've filled your head with exciting, encouraging, and powerfully wonderful news, what do we do? Well, let's notice this. We've got to be dogmatic. What does dogmatic mean? We've got to be intense. We've got to be intentional. We have to be serious about this. Number one, we've got to be desperate about our sin. To be convicted and so desperate knowing that we can do nothing about our sin. Notice, it drives us to Jesus. John 16, 8 to 9 says, When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, talking about the Holy Spirit. Righteousness is judgment about sin because they do not believe in me. In a... We must be desperate about our sin. We need to be convicted. Listen, here's the deal about, about somebody coming to know Christ. You need to feel convicted over your sin. Convicted. The Holy Spirit convicts us. We feel wretched and sorry and and awful about the fact we have sinned against a holy God and our sin has caused him to have to send his only son to die for us. We must be convicted over that. Secondly, we must declare and disclose our sin. We would use the word confess it, say it to the Lord and agree. And I've got to disclose it all. I have to sign like you do when when you sell your house a full disclosure agreement. Sometimes though we think with God, we we can sign a non-disclosure agreement. I can only confess the things I want to. (laughs) No, no. We confess it all. Lord, this is who I am and what I've done and how I've lived. I have lived for me. I have never lived for you. 
I want to declare and disclose my sin. Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. 1 John 1, 9, confessing our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It takes away the sin. The third thing, we must denounce our sin. This is important. We must denounce our sin. Because here's the deal. I can say it's sin and agree with God it's sin, but here's the kicker. I have to repent of that sin. I have to denounce it and say, that's not how I want to live. I'm walking this way, and I want to stop and walk a different way. Luke 13, verse 5 says, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I can say I'm a sinner. I can feel sorry for my sin. And I've seen it happen many, many times in my ministry. I've seen many a student come to youth camp, come to Disciple Night Weekend, feel really sorry, really bad about how they've lived, or an adult, same thing. And in the next minute, the next week, the next month, they are right back living like they were as if they'd never heard of God. Here's the problem. They confessed, but they never repented. Repented means I turn and walk a different way. Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return so that your sins will be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord Acts 17, 30, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Romans 2, 4, do not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Folks, it's God's kindness that leads to a place. And if you've ever been in that spot before and you remember the moment you confessed and repented of your sins, the burden that was lifted off of you. Or as a believer, the moment maybe you had wandered away and you had that huge weight of sin on your life and you confessed it and you repented of it. And that weight, that kindness of God pours over you. You say, thank you, God, that I don't have to live with that sin. That's the kind of God we serve. Notice these last three, and we're done this morning. We must depend on a deliverer. You see, I can confess, and I can repent, and I can feel convicted. But without a deliverer, I'm hopeless. Romans 5, 6 through 11 says this, While we were helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone who would dare even to die. But God, there's none of those but God moments, demonstrates his love towards us. And while they were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved through the wrath of God through him. For if while we were, sinner, uh, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ that through him we have now received this reconciliation. Titus 3, 4 through 8. I just want to give you these words of God. When God revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth, a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured his spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Here it is. And I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. We're going to talk more about that next week because we have one great creator, one great purpose, one great problem. But thank goodness we have one great Savior. You can't depend on yourself to save yourself. You cannot save yourself. Friend, you cannot be good enough, right enough, long enough. You cannot try to be moral enough, give money enough, come enough, give to the poor, whatever you want to do. You can name any righteous and religious thing you want to do, but it will never get you to heaven. The only way that you get to heaven is through the deliverer, through Jesus Christ. These last two, we have to remember our design. Remember, we talked about our creator. We've got to remember he's created us for his glory, to, to reflect his glory, to have a relationship with him, to know him, to serve him. And our response is we must become a disciple, a Christ follower. Jesus offers the invitations to his own disciples in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And I close with this. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, if anybody wants to be my disciple, wants to be a Christ follower, wants to ask Jesus Christ in the heart, wants to be born again, wants to be saved, whatever words you want to choose to use there, the church words or words that are not so churchy, you want to come after me. What do you have to do? You must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me daily. Another 
gospel says. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, and the gospels will save it. For what does a man profit? A man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So dear friend, as we close this morning, listen to me carefully. For those of us who know Christ as Savior and Lord, may we be always reminded of what he saved us from. We were saved from death. We were saved from being, being doomed and defeated. Now my question to you as a believer, are you living still like that though? Are you living a defeated life? Are you living like you're doomed? Are you living in that and, and living for your flesh and being depraved? We ought not be. We ought to walk in the truth of who we are. Are we trying to deflect our sin or, or, or are we trying to pretend our sin is not there, delete our own sin, hide from our sin, disguise it? Folks, we need to call it what Jesus calls it and he calls it sin, which is an offense to a holy God. So believer, I invite you to reflect this morning about where you once were and how by the grace of God you are where you are today. And maybe you need to come to a spot where you kind of have etched back in or eased back in that mode of dealing with sin the way the world deals with sin. And we need to come back to what Jesus says about sin. We need to be desperate to declare and disclose our sin to the Lord and denounce our sin. For those of you who don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, what a great moment. What a, I'm so glad you're here this morning. God had you here for a reason this morning. Listen to me carefully as we close. If you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, it's so simple. You have to admit to God you're a sinner. Ask Him to forgive you of all those sins, both past, present, and the future. To believe He's the Son of God, that He is your deliverer. He came and died for you. So you don't have to live a hopeless life. You don't have to live a defeated life. You can live that joyful life that the Savior brought to us, both now and in eternity to come. But you have to confess him as your Savior and be willing to commit your life to him as Lord for the rest of your days. I pray you would do that. And lastly, our 3151 challenge. I pray you will join me in taking the challenge to identify three people you want to pray for every single day. Oh God, would you save them? Maybe you don't know their salvation. Maybe you don't know where they are. That God would give you the opportunity to have that conversation. You'd pray for three people. You would be committed to learn one gospel presentation. I'm going to share several with you. In a few weeks, how you can do that. You don't have to wait because I just gave you one to ABCs. All of you know it. There's tracks. There's the Roman road. There's all kinds of ways you can tell your story. Invite five people to life groups. We want to see our life groups full. Last week, we had about 150 people more in worship than we did in life groups. That gap, as your pastor, is unacceptable. We, you need to be in a life group connected, learning, growing with other believers. And then lastly, you'll commit this month of October. For some of you, I'm praying for the first time, you'll say, I'm going to share the gospel with one person. Now, well, what if I want to share it with two? No, 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 don't, don't dare do that. Don't, don't, no, just one. Of course not. You share the gospel with 50 people in the month of October, and for every month from now until you leave this planet, but at least one person you would share the gospel with. I pray you take that 3-1-5-1 challenge. Would you pray with me this morning?